All right, hello and welcome everyone to the XYZ Ceramics and Digital Fabrication Symposium. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Matt Karras and I teach here in the ceramics program at Concordia University. This symposium accompanies this year's Virginia McClure Ceramics Biennial and brings ceramic artists Del Harrow, Elisa Al, Emre Khan, Jeannie Quinn, and myself, Matt Karras, together for discussion. There are many people to thank for this. I'd like to start by thanking Troy McClure for generally, uh, gen generously supporting the McClure Gallery and the Biennial. I'd also like to thank the show's curator, Amélie Prou, the Westmount Visual Arts Center and their staff. Thank you, Natasha Reed and Barbara Wisniewski and René Duval. Centre Materia, merci Guylain Gelvin and the Maison des Métiers d'Art, merci Thierry Plante Dubé. I'd also like to thank the Office of Research and Grad Graduate Studies at Concordia University, the Canada Council for the Arts, the Conseil des Arts et des Lettres du Québec, and the Conseil des Arts de Montréal. And I'd certainly like to thank Del Harrow for sharing his time and ideas with us here today. Thanks, Del. Uh, as the virtual hosts of this visit, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that Concordia University is located on unceded Indigenous lands. The Ganyagahaga Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters on which we gather today. Chochega, Montreal is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Today it is home to a diverse population of indigenous and other peoples. We respect the continued connections with the past, present and future in our ongoing relationship with indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. If you have questions during today's demo, please pose them in the chat and we'll parse through and answer uh, questions during or at the end of the Zoom as possible. For now, I'd ask that you keep yourselves muted and avoid uh, to avoid any background noise. And just so you know, we are recording this event. And now to welcome our guest. On behalf of the ceramics program, I'm very pleased to welcome Del Harrow. Del Harrow lives and works in Fort Collins, Colorado. Del is an associate professor at Colorado State University. His art practice spans sculpture and design and integrates traditional manual and uh, skill-based forming processes that, with digital fabrication technology. Dell has been invited to lecture widely on his own work and on the intersection of digital fabrication and craft in contemporary art and education. Recent, recent lectures include the Syracuse, Syracuse University and the Everson Museum of Art, the Auerbach Endowed Lecture Series at Hartford Art School in Connecticut, and the current Perspectives Lecture Series at Kansas City Art Institute. Dell's work has been exhibited at the Milwaukee Art Museum, the Denver Art Museum, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, and that's just to name a few. Dell Harrow, hello, and thank you for joining us. Hi, thanks. Thanks so much, Matt. Um, thank you, and thanks to everybody else who's been involved in coordinating this event, and, and um, also thank you all for coming this morning. Um, so uh, I'm going to kind of switch back and forth between a few different presentation formats. I'm going to start out in the PowerPoint presentation, and then I'll move over to my kind of CAD modeling software screen. And then we'll go back to the PowerPoint presentation. And um, I'll show you some videos of um, kind of working through the process of, of uh, making the work that's in the show in Montreal in my studio. Um, so please forgive the um, technical kind of jitteriness of, of switching between different formats. Hopefully this all works all right. I'm just gonna switch over to this PowerPoint presentation now. Um, let's see. Try that one more time. Doesn't seem like it's advancing. Can you all see the images on my screen? Yeah, looks good too. Okay, great. Um, well, I thought I'd start out by just showing a few images quickly of, of kind of my work more broadly over the last few years. And, and um, you know, I think this is just to kind of say that um, I, I or kind of illustrate, you know, I have a lot of different processes and techniques that I use in my studio. Um, uh, I use, you know, a lot of CNC tools, 
um, and digital fabrication tools. And then pieces are often also made using really old traditional processes of you know, coil building, slab building. Um, ideas kind of come for the work in, in a range of different ways. You know, I'm very interested in history and historical ceramics, um, very interested in, you know, kind of philosophy and the history of ideas. Um, and then I'm also, you know, always kind of experimenting playing, exploring like new tools and processes, um, you know, whether that's a process for slab building a piece or using plaster to make a mold or, um, you know, a process in, in the computer and computer aided design software. And I kind of feel like in the work, you know, uh, the, the kind of concept, the initial concept for a piece or the initial idea for a piece can, can kind of equally, you know, come from any one of those places. And in the work, what I'm interested in is kind of weaving those things together, you know, um, ideas about tools, ideas about the history of technology, ideas about processes, um, ideas about ceramic history, and, um, you know, ideas from, from philosophy and other realms. So um, that's a little bit the case in this piece, um, which is in the biennial. And in a way, um, this piece really began with um, kind of exploring some new tools within the computer-aided design software that I use. And I'll kind of show you that, um, the technical details of this a little bit more in a minute. Um, but the main computer-aided design software that I use is, is Rhino, um, which I think many of you are familiar with. And then I'm often using Rhino in combination with a, um, a kind of application that runs inside of the Rhino workspace, which is called Grasshopper. And Grasshopper is often described as like an algorithmic modeling or a parametric modeling um, application. And what it does is it basically allows you to kind of like write programs, um, but in a very visual way um, and in a way that has been more kind of intuitive for me as someone who doesn't you know, know very much at all about like writing computer code or anything like that. Um, so this piece really began by exploring this interesting tool inside of Grasshopper. This is a tool that's also all, all the tools that run inside of Rhino, they all have animal names. Um, so there's Grasshopper and then there's another tool that runs inside of Grasshopper, a lot of them, but this one is called Kangaroo. And Kangaroo is what's called a physics modeling um, application. So what it does is it's modeling physical processes. And I was just kind of exploring, playing with this tool and starting with this really simple form, um, which was just this form of a cylinder. And what you can do in Kangaroo is you can um, start applying physical conditions to an object like this and causing it to deform or collapse. Um, based on, you know, kind of virtual or simulated gravity. And I was starting with this really simple kind of idea, you know, about this uh, very basic kind of elemental cylindrical form and this process, which I found really kind of strange and beautiful of watching this form kind of distort or collapse. Um, and so I started thinking about, you know, this kind of, again, very elemental form in, in relation to the history of similar forms in ceramics and thinking about things like, you know, um, very old, uh, like water jars from the Japanese uh, tea ceremony, the tea ceremony, um, thinking about, you know, this, these um, uh, very elemental forms from mid-century modern design, like this kind of basin form by Gertrude Vascard. And um, just kind of thinking about, you know, what this digital object um, might offer to, you know, this, this idea, which I think is already kind of inherent in these ceramic forms, where there's something about this, you know, um, beautiful, very elemental kind of geometry, and then something about like the material, like working with or moving against this, right? You're seeing something about subtly, you know, the a sense of material and the force of gravity working on this um, on this geometry. 
And then, you know, often kind of always, I'm often thinking about these ideas of the still life um, as a way of thinking about, you know, relationships between, between objects and about objects within a space. And so in my work, you know, I, I'm very much an object maker. I'm interested in making objects kind of discrete, sort of portable entities, um, things. But then I'm also very interested in, in what happens when these objects are placed in relation to one another, you know, the kind of, the kind of music of that, um, the kind of the, the feelings that are evoked through that. And, you know, an artist who I think about all the time is, is the Italian painter, um, brilliant Italian painter, Giorgio Morandi. Um, so these are the pieces as they ended up. Um, that are, that are in, in Montreal at the McClure Gallery now. And along with this, you know, these kind of ideas about the cylinder, ideas about gravity, ideas about physical process and deformation, you know, I, I also in this piece was, was interested in this idea of like kind of creating a conversation between two different elements. Um, and, this is another thing, you know, maybe I would say about my work is that it, it often begins with a kind of intuition, maybe a, maybe a sort of formal intuition. You know, I've, I've been working a lot recently with a, with a dear friend, a poet, um, who's been, you know, collaborating together and, and working on teaching a class together. And I've, I've started thinking about this idea very much in relation to like the idea of poetry and, and what it is to write a poem where you know, in a poem, maybe there are ideas about meaning at the beginning of the process, but there's also a kind of formal process of kind of putting words in relation to each other. And there are similarities between words, you know, kinds of rhyming, but there also might be something happening like between the words in a poem, like a kind of tension or juxtaposition or difference. And there's an intuition about that. And then the meaning kind of grows out of it. Um, and all that is to say, you know, I had this, this instinct about pairing these cylindrical forms with another very different kind of a form. Um, a, a pairing a kind of like the cylinders are a, are a very sort of made thing in digital space and pairing those with a kind of found object. Um, so I'll talk about that a little bit more through the specific um, kind of technical processes of making the work. So I'm going to switch over now to my Rhino screen. And I don't know, I can't see the chat right now, but if Matt, if you want to jump in at any point, if there are any questions or yeah, need for I'll clarification as I'm, as I'm working along, or if I've skipped over something, just let me know. Of course, um, do that. So I'll just switch over now to, um, they're going to be moving between a few different Rhino files. Um, can everyone see this one? All right. It looks good. Yeah. Okay, great. So I'm in the Rhino software workspace now, and that is kind of this window that you see on the screen here, um, which, you know, you're navigating for those of you who aren't familiar with it, you know, you're navigating in a way that is, it, it's fairly intuitive, you know, I'm kind of scrolling with my mouse and, dragging the cursor around and I'm seeing this, you know, virtual simulated three-dimensional Cartesian space. Um, and, you know, I can draw forms inside of the Rhino workspace in a way that's kind of similar to, you know, any process of like drafting, um, except that I can draw things in, in you know, in simulated three dimensions here. Um, but then, I'm often working in Rhino um, with this application that now runs inside of Rhino. And this application is called Grasshopper uh, that I mentioned earlier. And again, this Grasshopper is sometimes referred to as like a visual programming language. Um, so the way Grasshopper works is, you know, in the same way that I could, um, Sure, how in depth to go. Maybe I'll just talk about this a little bit. Um, open a new document. So, in the same way that I could draw a form in the 
um, Rhino workspace, so I could draw a sphere like this by kind of dragging and clicking. Um, I can also draw a sphere in Grasshopper, um, but you do this in a little bit of a different way. So I do this by dragging what's called a component, and this is a sphere component into the Grasshopper workspace. And then a sphere is then defined by a couple of variables. Um, so it wants to know what the base plane is for the sphere. And that's basically telling it where that sphere is located. And it also wants to know the radius of that sphere. And so then I can create another component here, just a slider. And the slider just outputs a number, but that number is dynamic. So as I move the slider around, that number changes. And when I connect it up here to the radius variable input in the sphere component, then this number being output from the slider component then defines that radius of the sphere. And I can move that around and it's dynamic and updatable. And so I can build geometry of increasing complexity by just dragging these components into the um, Grasshopper workspace and connecting them together and building kind of a little program, a little you know, app, software application. Um, but in Grasshopper, this is called a, uh, a definition. So this is the definition that is used to create these um, collapsing cylinders, all of these forms. And um, it's actually a fairly simple definition, even though you know in Grasshopper things start looking really complicated really quickly. Um, but you know, basically all it's doing is it's creating a, um, a circle here at the bottom, and then it's taking that circle and then extruding it to create a cylinder. So I can um, update those you know, variables here, radius and the height here, that, and then, um, and then it's turning that cylindrical form into what's called a mesh. So it's kind of um, breaking it up into um, this kind of faceted geometry, um, these triangles. And so I can adjust, you can see kind of the resolution of that mesh by moving these sliders around. Oops. I think I'm about to crash grasshopper on my computer. This software gets really processor intensive really fast. So it's like I'm running a lot of things right now. Um, so I can adjust the mesh of that cylinder. And then there are these tools, um, which I mentioned earlier. And this is kind of like a really sophisticated component, you know, different than just that little component that I drop in that makes uh, a cylinder. And this is a component from you know, this plugin for Grasshopper called Kangaroo. And this component does a whole bunch of things where I can start determining variables that begin to simulate physical forces acting on this object. So this is like this really complicated thing. I don't really understand it you know, very much. I don't really understand that much about how it works. I mean, I kind of have some thoughts or ideas about it, but this is something I'm just sort of borrowing um, just in a similar way to, you know, any of us using a piece of technology really that we didn't invent, which is most pieces of technology where I'm, I'm, I'm kind of taking this tool and I'm trying to do something, you know, with it um, in my own work, trying to make something with it. So this component, um, if I begin this simulation, you can see here this force of gravity starting to work on the cylinder, and I am defining how much force should be exerted by that downward pull of gravity. Um, the other things I'm defining here are I'm saying, like, 
basically each little segment of this mesh is sort of like a spring. And so I can define like, what is the relaxed state of it? So, you know, is it the size it is at the beginning or is it trying to constrict into something a little bit smaller or expand out into something a little bit larger? And I can define um, how much force is being exerted by those springs. And I think there are a couple other things happening in this definition. And so then at any point, I can just stop this simulation and freeze that collapsing object in its current state. And then um, I can use this command um, in Grasshopper, which is called bake. And the bake command just takes that model and um, kind of freezes it in the Rhino workspace. So now this form exists in the Rhino uh, workspace, Rhino native workspace. And so I just started by kind of creating a lot of cylinders like that. And I really, I really enjoyed this process. You know, you set up all these variables and then it kind of, it feels a little bit like, you know, being a potter, like throwing on the wheel, you know, something about like, I don't know, someone like Edmund Duval maybe, and, um, or, you know, Takeshi Yasuda or something like that. And someone exploring these really elemental cylindrical forms. And each one has this thing happening, you know, uh, a little variation in proportion, you know, some little kind of gesture, some sort of um, way in which the kind of softness of the clay reveals itself. And so just kind of thinking about all of that in this digital space as a kind of analog for that, um, you know, physical process of, of, of throwing a series of cylinders on the wheel. Um, so then after um, creating these forms in Grasshopper, um, the next step is I took them into um, another uh, Rhino file. And basically now I'm starting to think about how to actually make them in clay, in physical material. And I've done a little bit of direct 3D printing of clay. I mean, I've kind of been working with that process for a number of years, but the primary process I use um, when using digital fabrication tools in, in combination with ceramics is to use plaster in some way, and to use mold making in some way. And so what I'm often thinking about in the Rhino model is um, how to not only design an, an object that I want to become a clay object, but I'm also thinking about the kind of architecture of how to create a mold and a, um, uh, a, an easy, basically a pretty, you know, straightforward mold making process. Um, so um, here, what I'm doing is I'm just breaking these cylinders up into segments in a similar way to how you might part a form like this, um, just as a physical object for making a mold. But then in the Rhino model, I'm also building the parting planes. Um, and I'll show you some images of this in a second. So the way um, I ended up fabricating these is I ended up um, 3D printing, not the entire cylinder, but instead 3D printing all of these segments with parting planes in them and then pouring plaster into them and then putting the plaster blocks together. So in a way what I'm fabricating is, um, or what I'm printing on a 3D plastic printer, I just use a Prusa, printer that I have in my studio, um, instead of printing a complete prototype, I'm basically printing what might be called like a, a, a master mold or a mold for the mold parts. So I ended up making um, kind of three cylinder forms for this exhibition. And this is the Rhino file that's breaking up all those cylinder forms into pieces. So this one has like four segments kind of stacked too high, four segments around stacked too high. This one is eight segments on the outside. And then this one is four segments. Um, so then that's kind of the first part of the piece. And then the second part, um, and again, 
you know, I, it's kind of this intuition, a sort of poetic intuition about pairing this cylindrical form with another kind of a form, you know, and something I think a lot about, I mean, you probably hear this as I'm talking, like I often think in I think fairly formal ways. Um, so even when I'm thinking about digital form, I often think about this idea of kind of typologies of digital form. So one type of digital form or typology of digital form might be those objects which we like model or design um, in CAD space in the computer. Um, within that, a kind of subset might be um, forms which are algorithmically or parametrically modeled using a process like you see in Grasshopper where the form is defined through a set of parameters. And then maybe a very different typology of ceramic form or sorry, digital form might be kinds of forms which um, come from 3D scans of the physical world. And so part of the kind of idea for this piece was to kind of put together these two different digital form types in one piece. And so the second part of the form, which are these sort of small fragments of um, figures, you know, they're small hands, small eyes, came from, um, it's really, you know, interesting website, kind of incredible resource, which is available on the internet. This just came from a website called Scan the World. Um, and on this website are uploaded all of these amazing, really high resolution, three-dimensional models of, um, of uh, classical, you know, Greek and Roman statues. And, um, Often they're uploaded by museums. Um, so there's an amazing collection that comes from the National Museum in Denmark. And um, attached to them, you know, a little bit like maybe putting other content up in digital form, um, attached to them often are like restrictions in terms of how they can be used or how the authors would want them to be used. And I think all of this is really interesting. You know, it feels very analogous to like the idea of sampling in music. Um, so this kind of question about, you know, what what is what is the relationship between, you know, uh, a, a, a maker using sources from history um, raises questions about ideas of authorship and appropriation that I'm really curious about. So basically I started downloading these models and kind of cutting them apart and sampling. Them. And there's also something, and I'm not, you know, um, kind of overlooking in this process, there's something really strange about that, you know, um, actually cutting apart, you know, these statues, breaking them apart into fragments. And so, you know, I also really started in this piece thinking a lot about that that history of kind of thinking about a, 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 a cultural object, you know, an object from human material culture being used as, as material or seen as material in some way. You know, there's this museum in London, which I love, really interested in. It's called the Sir John Stone Museum. And John Stone was a, Sir John Stone was a kind of architect aristocrat in the with the 1800s in, in England, you know, at a time when if you had money and were, you know, lived in a colonial hour, um, you could kind of just go to Egypt or Rome or, or, um, or, or, or Greece and, and um, just break parts off of statues and, or pick up fragments of, of, of um, class, from classical antiquity and and just take them home with you and so the john Stone museum there are these three um row houses that he or three houses which he kind of connected together uh, to create this museum and the interior is just covered with um you know fragments of greek roman egyptian statuary and so there's something i mean it's a you know, it's an amazing space. It's like really beautiful in some ways, but it there's a there's also a, 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 a kind of violence in it, and it's it's complicated. Um, so I, I don't know. I don't know exactly what to say about all of that, except I feel like these are all ideas, thoughts that were coming up for me in making this piece and um, the specific uh, 
statues what I, which I chose, I guess I would say, um, to use, both of them also as myths, as, you know, classical mythology, um, both refer to, you know, myths which deal with kind of ideas of, of possession, of, of avarice, of, um, of, of nature and kind of protecting nature. So the fragments are taken from statues from one, the myth of Eris, who I guess was a, a goddess of, of jealousy, actually, and, and um, the particular statue depicts this story, this myth in which Eris was um, jealous in this gathering of the gods. And so to kind of create discord, um, she took an apple and she threw it into this group of gods who were gathering together for some convivial occasion and um, said, you know, whoever picks up this apple is the most beautiful. And um, Venus picks up this apple. And you see, you know, in the piece that I made, you see this fragment of that statue and it's Venus's hand holding that apple. And then this statue here is a depiction of the goddess Artemis, who um, I guess was a, I'm not an expert in, in, you know, Greek mythology by any means, but um, Artemis was a, goddess, a, a hunter, a kind of protector of the space of the forest. And one of the myths of Artemis, stories of Artemis, which I find the most compelling is um, the story in which uh, a hunter, um, I think it's Actaeon, comes upon Artemis like bathing naked in, in the forest. And there's a kind of a, a sort of a violation there, right, to, to see this, this naked body, um, sort of symbolic of a kind of, you know, question about violation of nature. And, and um, as punishment, Artemis turns the hunter into a deer, into a stag, and he's devoured by his own, um, his own hunting dogs. And uh, so, uh, I don't know, it's a little bit of a tangent, but I suppose all this is to say, you know, just thinking about, is there a kind of psychic toll um, to this um, incredible access and the sense that like through digital space, we can kind of in a way possess anything we want and anything in the world, but what, what, what price do we pay for that in some way? Sorry, that was a, oh, I'm going way over time. It's hard to know what you're doing when you're in the <laughs> virtual space. So I'll just switch back. I, I'm just going to, click through the last slides from the PowerPoint presentation. Um, and I uh, don't really have that much more to say about them. They just kind of show the rest of the technical process, I guess is what I'm actually supposed to be talking about. Um, there we go. So anyway, these are those 3D printed um, basically master molds or parts for the mold parts off of the 3D printer, a bunch of those. I just print those in PLA plastic. And then I'm setting them up on a casting table here, um, just with a little bit of uh, aluminum flashing, just taped to the back. I just hot glue them down to a piece of melamine. Um, and then you can see in the back, these are 3D printed kind of fragments from these classical statues, um, which are parted in a more traditional way. And then this is what the plaster mold, um, one of the plaster molds end up, ends up looking like as I'm putting it together on the casting table. And then um, here are just a few videos of um, kind of assembling these molds and pouring the casts. And um, maybe this is just a good time, you know, I can just let these uh, videos run in the background. And if you all have any, any questions or anything I can clarify about the technical process. We can move over to that. If there's still time, maybe I used all the oh, time. Yeah. No, no, there's plenty of time. And okay. so if anybody has questions, you can type them in the chat and I'll read them out. I guess that some of the questions I have right away are, well, looking at the, the molds, it's so satisfying to see how you make them. Uh, it's, yeah, just, ah, it's satisfying just to see the process. And I, I'm, well, one question I had was just as you print those PLA segments, you're printing those solid or is there infill or they're 100% or solid PLA? 
there is infill in those, um, but they're not, you know, they're not very thick. They're like, um, I can't remember, like, like, uh, 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 like around three sixteenths of an inch thick, probably. Yeah. And that was a little bit of just a guess. You know, I was like trying to find a sweet spot there mm -hmm. between something that won't distort through the mold making process and through the printing process too much, but also that has a little bit of flexibility so that it'll pop off the plaster nicely. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, back to your original question or the first, first part of your question, the first kind of piece. Yeah, I've, I feel like I spend a lot of time thinking about that. And I'm, I'm not someone like, I don't know if many people do. I don't like love to have my hands in plaster all day, um, but I really love so many things about like what plaster can do for you as a, you know, in, in with clay and as a, as a ceramic artist. So I find like a lot of the work I'm doing in the, in the computer, I'd rather do that work like parting an object up in digital space and then have the plaster, the mold making process just be like really clean and really efficient. And um, yeah, I love that about this process that it's like you can pour a whole eight part mold like with one batch of plaster. So there is a real efficiency about it that I, I also really enjoy. Um, they did at that thickness, they did distort a little bit, like the molds don't, they don't fit like perfectly, perfectly together. So I don't know, there might be a little adjustment that I might do there in future iterations. This is actually the first time I've ever used this particular process. I, uh -huh. I do a lot of work where I CNC machine foam and use foam as a, as a, um, a like a master mold in the same way. Yeah. Um, I can kind of skip forward here. This is kind of boring. So here's actually pouring the casting slip into the mold. Well, this is good. I mean, we were talking about some of the stuff today in class and what's kind of cool about what you're doing here is you've, you're building up a clay coil at the top to kind of create mm -hmm. the reserve that way. Mm -hmm. And I, the, are the parts just butting up against each other or is there a registration mark either on the side or underneath? They're just butting up against each other. And, um, and again, yeah, I've made other pieces like lots of different key systems with my mm -hmm. CNC machined master molds. These ones, you know, there's um, a, a little bit of topography in the parting plane. So they do key together a little bit, um, but there's a little work you have to do when you're clamping them together to get the molds to fit together well. And then, yeah, I'm just using a coil of clay at the top for the reservoir. And I find, I, I don't know, I kind of, toggle back and forth in a way between like really engineered, like highly engineered molds where, I mean, I have other molds where I would cast a reservoir and like, you know, have some elaborate key system between the mold parts and between that and, and just, you know, like this one feels a little bit more like I was just kind of trying to get, you know, get the objects out of the mold and trying to do that in as, as, as fast a way as possible. And mm -hmm. it's nice. So, yeah, it works. And I guess that's the main kind of important yeah. qualifier in there. I think you brought up, I mean, this is a technical demo, but I think you brought up something that's at the heart of the matter of working digitally and the access that we have to models and the, the website you talked about, Scan the World, or the, the potential for appropriating things that we may not that we shouldn't or, you know, and I, so I guess I wonder how you personally navigate those issues because it's something I'm curious about too. And I have my own kind of system of how I navigate it, but how do you approach that? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm curious about what, what your system is or how you would describe that. I mean, I, I don't know. It's something I've been thinking a lot about lately. And I, I feel like I have a kind of, um, intuition about it like you know and, and like I say it's kind of intuitive where certain things whether they're software tools or you know digital models like certain things kind of feel like too packaged to me sometimes or like like someone else has put too much work into it so it feels like I don't really um 
you know, as a, as a maker, like using sophisticated digital technology. I mean, I, I feel like in one way we're always collaborating, you know, and we're building up, upon a history of, of technical innovation, like a long history of technical innovation. And, you know, you spoke about this a little bit in the presentations. I mean, I think that's true with any ceramic technology, whether it's throwing on the wheel or, you know, slip casting using plaster, right? I'm, I'm borrowing and using lots of tools which other people developed, but I also, and again, this is kind of a gut level thing. I feel like I need to feel like I'm adding something to it as well. Like I'm, I'm bringing something to that collaboration rather than like just kind of using or taking advantage of work other people have done. But I don't know, I feel like that's a fairly like subjective um, judgment or thought. And I feel like in a way, you know, the questions maybe I was kind of trying to raise with this piece, maybe again, in kind of an intuitive way, or one, like using these found models, that feels a little bit like at, the, at some limit for me, where I felt a little like, is that wrong? Like, is this going too far? Like, am I just kind of taking too much, like from, you know, um, a form which already exists in the world, which has its own history, which has its own context. Um, but I think as makers too, there's maybe something productive about like, pushing those limits of your own comfort as well um, as a way of um, challenging or reflecting on like the very question that you're asking. So I suppose all that's to say like, it's a, it's, it's a kind of intuitive process, um, which I think involves also like, should, should involve like kind of challenging the assumptions that each of us might bring to the table and, and using the work as a thinking technology, you know, as a technology through which to challenge our own assumptions or thinking that we make about, you know, quest, questions of, of ethics and aesthetics and appropriation. Mm -hmm. That makes sense to me. I mean, the, the kind of um, contribution component. I mean, one thing I think of in the context of what you've what you sourced in your piece is also, you know, like I learned about Greek mythology through what you kind of your research or your description of it too. So there's a way that it kind of carries those on. And it also doesn't like, I guess my markers are either a social one or an economic one. Does it hinder someone else's social kind of code or is there mm -hmm. something I don't understand in there, mm -hmm. which is a hard one to navigate? Because if you don't know it, then you don't know that you're missing out on something or that you're unaware of something. And the other is a sort of economical one. Are you taking the livelihood away from someone? And those two things end up being kind of like pivot points in there. I did notice one question over here and it was the part I think where you were emptying out your mold with a shock <laughs> vacuum. And, uh, and it's, is that a type of vacuum you're using? And is that a shop vac you've dedicated to emptying out your molds? You know, that's a bucket head vacuum. You can see the brand there uh -huh. from Home Depot. I do not endorse <laughs> Home Depot for a range of other reasons, but yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, it is. And I wish I could say that was my idea. Um, that was a, uh, oops, it's the sound of the shop back. That was an idea that I stole or stole, I don't know, uh, the artist Andy Brayman, um, turned me on to this technique. I would prob probably, if I'm honest, probably about 40% of any good technical idea I've ever had came from Andy, um, but a uh, really brilliant artist. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's just that uh, you just put it on the top of a five gallon bucket and it's such a great way to empty large molds, um, any mold you can get inside really. Uh, so efficient, you know, you don't have to pick up the whole mold and try to flip it over. Um, and you get actually a really clean uh, interior of the cast because um, it kind of drains in such a clean way. And then you just kind of get the um, uh, suction like right down there at the bottom. And you can also really kind of vary like the thickness at the bottom of your cast, which sometimes, sometimes is useful. 
I think I saw Andy at one point with this technique, like doing some fun things where he would like drain a mold a little way and then stop and then drain it a little more and then stop. And he'd use it as a way to create some kind of articulation at the rim or the edge of the piece. Um, so I don't know, fun, fun ways you can play with this That's, tool process. Yeah, I would never have thought to like have the, the idea of tool articulation in a shop vac or emptying. <laughs> <laughs> like, the, there are decisions everywhere or there's the possibility mm -hmm. of articulating something at every point. Um, mm -hmm. So, and then I guess just uh, did, you have to rinse that that bucket head out every time, or is it an easy thing? Well, to do? yeah, I mean you, the hose comes off, so you can rinse the hose off, and um, you know all it's doing is it's just creating a vacuum inside the bucket, and so then the bucket is the bucket is what's sucking. Yeah, um, it's not sucking through the mechanism of the vacuum cleaner. So um, it's pretty easy to clean. Some of the slip often kind of splashes up on like there's kind of a cage inside of the vacuum, but it's really, it's really pretty easy to clean. Mm -hmm. um, I just kind of, this one, this is like a black casting slip. So it's got a lot of stain in it. And I kind of dedicate this vacuum cleaner to this color of stain. Um, mm -hmm. but, and you um, said you were printing in PLA, but I also heard you say like fused plaster. What did you... Use plaster. Oh, I don't know. I don't know what I was. No, I, I. Yeah, I'm just printing in PLA. PLA and casting off of that directly. Yeah. And I guess, the, and then those master molds end up sticking around the studio. You can cast again with them, or do they get deteriorated by that that cast? Oh no. I mean, well, I'm so I'm using the PLA and then casting this USG number one pottery plaster. Oh, the master molds. Yeah. No, these these ones were fine afterwards. So yeah, if I wanted to cast another set of plaster molds, I totally could. Um, and I don't know. I'm yeah, I'm interested in this piece. I think I might make a larger series of like with more variety mm -hmm. of forms. You know, just even just kind of the still life component of this piece, I find really I don't know. There's something quite quite moving for me about it. I mean, it is that kind of, you know, Giorgio Morandi, Edmund DeWall language of, of repetition and variation, which res resonates for me, as I know it does for many others. I, there's this, I don't remember who said this, but um, art theorist, art historian described um, Morandi's still life paintings as like a a visual analog of a Bach cello concerto. Hmm. And I don't really know that much about music from a you know technical point of view. And I, I never felt like I really understood that idea until I heard this interview on Terry Gross with um, John Baptiste, uh, the uh, musician who is an ama amazing musician in his own right, but he's gained kind of popular acclaim for being the, the house band leader for um, Stephen Colbert. Um, huh, okay, but also yeah. Juilliard trains, you know, phenomenal jazz and classical musician. And he was talking about Bach actually in these cello concertos and just describing like how simple they are, like, and how much they're just about symmetry and pattern, you know, and these like very, very simple patterns and scales. And yet there's something in like these subtle variations within that very elemental kind of pattern which becomes so moving for us and and um so i don't know there's something in this work i mean again something i'm doing really but just in the way in which these different kinds of geometry you know the geometry of the cylinders the geometry of like the way in which some forms are repeated and the number of different forms and which forms are repeated and then the geometry of um the faceting in the surface and then the way in which the faceting is kind of like subtly distorting where I, I don't know it just really feels like there's something there maybe to, to explore. It's interesting to hear you form analogies with music um, and I find it helpful somehow to think through that and you were earlier talking about an analogy to poetry and sort of thinking I guess uh, as I took it is you were discussing a, a looking at poetry and thinking of composition, uh, visual composition, but sort of analogous to poetry. And mm -hmm. I, I guess um, I wonder how 
I mean, I see that also as taking place with the digital world. There's something about working physically and then going to that, that sometimes clarifies what we're doing by flipping from one mm-hmm. form to the other. And um, I don't really know where I'm going with this question, but I'm curious to know sort of from you, it sounds like the poetry is a new approach or some, there's something novel in there for you. And how has that affected, you know, what, has it changed the, what you're making entirely or... I don't think it has changed it entirely but what would you say yeah i mean i think it's um so the the kind of main poet who i've been collaborating with is my dear friend um dan beachy quick and um we have been you know we're we're working on some a number of different projects together and we've also twice co-taught this um experimental class at, at, at the university where i teach colorado state university and the class is just called Pottery and Poetry. And um, one of the ideas which has really come forward through that um, class is, you know, this idea that in the same way um, as potters or ceramists or artists, we engage with, you know, clay as a material. And there's some kind of fecund generative, you know, space which um, emerges out of the interaction between kind of mind body and material Um, and the kind of one of the realizations for me in that class is that that is very much I think the way in which many poets are engaging language so in fact Mm -hmm. language is a kind of material um, and for for a poet and they're trying somehow to get maybe beyond like the assumptions we make about like the symbolic meaning of language to engage with the materiality of it, you know, Mm. um, to kind of break or interrupt like our expectations or assumptions about, you know, what language is used and how it's used as a kind of instrumental device for communication. Mm. Um, So, um, that yeah as you say i mean just that those kinds of reflections of you know collaborating with um artists poets who kind of work in materials other than our own but seeing ways in which we see our own thinking kind of reflected in the way they work i feel like is really powerful and giving maybe giving us other language for thinking about our own work maybe actually deepening or complicating um, the ways you know in which we 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 think about our own our own work so that that's what I would say about it I'd say those collaborations have really I think I hope like kind of deepened my thinking um, maybe things that I would like overlook or take for granted it just assumptions I would make to hear them sort of reflected back through the context and practice and discipline of poetry it's like kind of can heighten your attention to something which you may just sort of jump past or overlook um, mm-hmm. And like, for example, I mean, those kind of the the formal description, you know, I was making of this piece. I mean, I think that's something that, you know, my collaborations with Dan have kind of uh, attuned me to and given another level of like patience and attention for and towards. And I also find, I don't know if you find this, um, I, you know, kind of by disposition, this is probably you know, cultural, temperamental, um, socioeconomic, there's probably a bunch of things, you know, by dint of coming from maybe a family, you know, my, my grandfather was a university professor. So there's a bunch of things kind of feeding into our, each of our sort of dispositions as artists. And I don't want to deny or overlook that, but, um, I, I have often kind of by disposition or inclination in some ways, I would call myself a, a formalist kind of a formalist. Like I, mm-hmm. I find that I, I'm excited about ideas um, for work, about thinking about work in a way that comes out of thinking about form, um, uh, formal relationships, what I would call formal relationships. And, but I also think, you know, in the contemporary art world in some ways and at certain moments in my own education, that's kind of a, can, there can be pejorative associations with the idea of, of formalism um, mm-hmm. and certainly ways in which I think in the history of art, which like formalist critique has really has been abused, um, you know, about people like Clement Greenberg or something where, mm-hmm. you know, 
uh, form, formal judgment becomes a kind of proxy for reinforcing a kind of, you know, uh, a, a hegemony or hierarchy of taste, um, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I find that out of that kind of disposition, inclination towards thinking about work in a, you know, in a, what I would call a formal way, I find that I'm like searching for other language, other ways of thinking about that. Like, well, what does that mean to have an inclination towards, you know, thinking of the work formally? Um, how can I sort of move beyond like the, you know, the kind of basic terminology, you know, that we use like, you know, mass, mass void relationships and proportion and scale. And um, so that's another thing where I feel like music and poetry have both given me um, help, helped with that, helped with kind of what I, what I think are powerful kind of reflections and analogies and music in particular, but poetry equally. I mean, poetry is about a kind of music, right? It's about kind of, I think, um, bringing forward the music of language alongside the you know, kind of semantic, you know, communicative, communicative instrumental function as, as meaningful form to, mm -hmm. to kind of revealing the, the emotional depth of the music inside of language and and that like in John Baptiste's you know description of the the Bach cello concertos you know that idea that it's kind of math at some level like the Bach concerto you know it's very they're very formal in structure but there's also powerful feeling powerful emotion like that comes out of that that comes through this a, a formal kind of play or a formal kind of game and um I don't know that that realization has been really important for me mm -hmm. um, to kind of, you know, again, I think as artists, we're often we have some disposition or inclination towards making in a certain way. And um, in some ways, I, I think we're kind of searching for people, thinkers, colleagues, collaborators who can um, empower, give voice to and and deepen those those feelings or sensibilities, which we're sort of on the cusp of. Oh, it's super interesting to hear you talk about this. Um, Del, thank you so much uh, for your demo, uh, for showing us the underside of Rhino. Uh, <laughs> grasshopper, this you're whole other world, yeah. uh, that's a part of it. Um, and also for talking about your work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, really enjoyed that. Appreciate your time. Um, so we've got one more event coming up for this XYZ Symposium. It's on Friday at 2 p.m. So join us for our roundtable discussion. And uh, otherwise, I'll see you either in the studio or on Zoom. And Dell, take care. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, everyone.